Thank you, Riley, and welcome everyone to today's session. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. And uh, we'll be going through some solutions here and discussions around uh, supporting and, and filling the homework gap, which uh, has been identified within the United States here as, as 17 million plus students that do not have broadband access today. Um, and this, uh, this gap was was highlighted very much so within the last, uh, you know, 16, 18 months by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so there have been uh, some funding measures, emergency funding measures from the federal government. Um, and there's many providers, you know, nationwide even before this that were focused on, on filling this gap and really ensuring that uh, students across the United States um, are, are able to get online, support the learning, uh, you know, remote learning initiatives that are now in play. And, and the ongoing move towards more and more digital learning initiatives. So we'll talk a little bit about, um, about the funding uh, up front here to start, and then we'll move a bit more into some of the solutions that um, uh, have been uh, or are available and are potentially uh, eligible for, for some of this federal funding, uh, and, and also include some discussions around the costs and TCO about that as well. So if you have any questions along the way, please pop them in to the questions uh, uh, section there. And then there are a couple handouts as well um, that uh, you can download this presentation as well as one that's a little more about the ECF. So we'll start off here. Um, the, uh, you, you're probably aware of, of several acts that have been um, put in place by the federal government um, over the past uh, 16 months uh, based on the pandemic. Um, you know, several multi-trillion dollar initiatives and, and a lot of uh, money associated with that was targeted at uh, broadband access and providing uh, technology uh, for different organizations, in particular schools and uh, educational institutions, um, so that they can support the transition to remote learning. So um, we're going to talk a lot about this specific fund, which just became active yesterday as far as the application window. So the timing for the webinar today is, was really given uh, based on that. Uh, but this is a fund that only was established last month by the FCC, and uh, it's part of the American Rescue Plan Act. So you probably heard of different uh, acts, CARES Act, and, and things that were put in place over the last uh, uh, year or so. Um, this specific fund is for $7.2 billion and is uh, targeted at Internet access for students that are off campus. So when you're in remote learning scenarios, obviously you may not be in school or you might be in hybrid scenarios and you need access to the internet to, to do your work. Um, you know, we hear the stories today of, you know, folks having to go to relatives' houses or going to the public park or other location just to do their schoolwork, parking in the parking lot of the school, et cetera. And I know that many of our customers scrambled at, in March of last year to figure out ways of supporting these, um, these students. Now, many of them, allocated MiFi devices, you know, to their students to take home and, and get access. Um, but there's a lot of challenges associated with that. So um, we've been looking at different ways to, to fill this gap and to support our, our customers and our service providers um, related to this, this type of, uh, of need. So this act actually um, went into effect starting yesterday and, and basically applies to technology purchases uh, related to this starting tomorrow and for the following uh, year or so. Um, a little bit more about what products this, uh, this act is, is associated with. And we're still learning as we go, right? So this is all very new and, and moving very quickly. But, you know, the idea is, you know, you need to internet access and then you need something to access the internet with. So um, as it's conceived of today, this, this funding would apply to uh, laptops and tablet computers. Um, and Wi-Fi hotspots. And I think a key point here is that, is that last bullet is, um, you know, the, the broadband service is, is funded in general if there's something commercially available. Um, but in some cases, there may be no broadband. And these are the most rural, hard to reach areas. Um, the fund will support the construction of new networks on a case by case basis where, where access is not available. So some of these rules are still being defined. And, um, you know, there, there definitely is a, a lot here that is, is, is to be determined, um, but be aware that um, the funding has extended out to include those scenarios in cases where, where it's needed. Um, obviously, the, the overall thrust and, and, and orientation of the funding is to get access to everyone. So whether that's through existing services or new ones, um, that, that is supported. 
And then just real quickly about the application process. I, as I mentioned, the funding started yesterday, or the filing window rather, and then the, the uh, FCC and USAC who administers the funding will be, will be moving forward uh, with those applications over the next uh, um, you know, 60 days. They expect to process half of them. So it's a pretty quick turn, uh, turnaround. I mean, this is an emergency funding, so everything is happening pretty quickly in terms of uh, the applicability there. So um, I think a, a key message here is if, if there are schools and uh, public libraries in your area you know, that are um, in need and have students that, that could benefit from this, um, the application link uh, there, the, the website is available for them to uh, start that process. Many may not be aware of it or, or otherwise, um, but your, your service area as, a, as an internet service provider it probably contains, you know, a number of schools that, that would be looking or could benefit from, from this uh, program. Now, the, the discussion today, you know, the, the title, we kind of focused on the ECF, but there are many other, oops, it's kind of building a little strange, but there are many other um, uh, funds that are available for broadband access or technology. Here's another one, the EBB. There's also funds that, that were implemented last year, for example, the CARES Act. So, um, you know, th this is not the only one to, to talk about is the ECF. It's just the new one that just kind of kicked off uh, just recently. Um, this, this act here was, was specific to uh, providing internet access and reimbursing um, consumers, not necessarily schools, but uh, consumers for internet access. And the intent of the ECF is to work hand in hand with the EBB. So, you know, there are rules to, you know, to prevent duplicate funding for the same, the same household or what have you related to that. Um, but this act has been going on for some time, actually, um, about a month and a half. And, um, and there's already uh, several billion um, that have been allocated, or I'm sorry, several million customers that have actually uh, taken um, applications out for this and about a, a thousand broadband providers. So a lot going on. It's a very fast and dynamic uh, environment here with respect to what's happening. Um, but so you're aware that, that there are multiple funding initiatives in place relative to this. Okay, um, I am going to hand it over at this point to uh, Saqib. And if you want to take take the controls there and uh, right, Bruce, shift over to your presentation. Sure, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and move towards uh, the solution side of things. Okie doke. Sorry, give me one second. Okay, uh, so um, thanks, Bruce, uh, for the uh, overview on the funding and whatnot. Um, what I what I wanted to uh, touch on is, and I'm going to move ahead to the next slide. So first and foremost, um, in the audience member today, um, there are folks that are probably quite familiar with uh, fixed wireless solutions, uh, but I also want to kind of uh, present some uh, options here that may be new. Uh, to the audience, as well as as other people see this webinar, I want to make sure that uh, we understand what uh, what uh, wireless can do in terms of this objective that we're talking about, right? Uh, connecting the unconnected, closing the homework gap, um, and how education institutions can leverage wireless to quickly expand uh, and and solve that problem that was so pronounced uh, during the pandemic. Um, so. From that perspective, the first slide is a pretty simple one that from a Cambium Networks perspective, whether it's urban, indoor, uh, outdoor, the fixed wireless play uh, across multiple solutions is really strong um, in building out a uh, gigabit uh, wireless fabric network. Um, but the first one that I, I, I want to talk about, and I'm hoping Andrew, uh, when we get into a little bit of Q&A, you can shed some light on how you guys have done this, but you know, the, the concept of a, a traditional point to multi point fixed wireless network. Um, what we have seen and, and picked up along the way that during the pandemic, uh, the strong reaction uh, to students not having internet access and, and being able to do e learning was to quickly go and get Wi Fi devices from the ATT Verizons of the world and, and distributing that. Um, what we conclude, and, and, and I believe that the school districts and, and uh, others along the way uh, conclude that this is not a sustainable model. 
uh, MiFi devices with the recurring cost, the overhead of management, all of that is challenging. Um, on the flip side, waiting for fiber and copper and advanced DSL services to be deployed is also not really viable. Uh, so one thing that we talk about that we come from and, and the service providers on this call can and vouch for it is, is building up a, a fixed wireless network, uh, which can sit in the school campus as the uh, point of presence. You can uh, relay it using uh, potentially uh, additional towers in your uh, municipality partnerships and, and build out at a point to multi-point network using fixed wireless. And at the end, you put a Wi-Fi router inside the house and now the students are essentially at, accessing the school network right from home. Um, this gives you a much bigger flexibility than let's say firing up Wi-Fi on the campus itself and communities and churches because you're bringing that school network inside the home. And you know, it may feel daunting things like, hey, uh, we have to put a device on the roof, but I'm showing a picture on the bottom left as well as what a typical you know, addition antenna may look like and what a Wi-Fi router may look like. Um, the good news is that this is what has been done in, in rural parts of the United States for many, many years. There is no, need, no reason this can't be expanded for the purposes of uh, ECF and other funds that uh, are promoting that broadband connectivity. Uh, last but not least, from a technology perspective, you know, we have numerous solutions. So whether somebody's interested in a 3.5 CBRS-based solution, but they want to do something like an LTE solution, uh, that's an option. We have numerous solutions using uh, proprietary unlicensed spectrum, such as 5 gig. Um, and then in some cases, millimeter wave to bring that gigabit-like performance with 60 gigahertz. So all of these become viable options to build out that point to multi-point network, again, extending that school uh, coverage. The second scenario is the concept of, uh, you know, outdoor uh, uh, Wi-Fi. Um, and again, this is, a, a, again, you could essentially extend the school network, uh, doing the backhaul with different types of solutions, uh, but then uh, putting up Wi-Fi hotspots in playgrounds, in, uh, the, you know, remote school campuses, uh, community centers, church parking lots, anywhere where the students can gather. And good news about this is if you do this, um, you, are, you are serving the community. This is no longer just about the school, uh, but potentially partnerships where school students can come in and VPN in and get access, but others can do it with an open access. Uh, lots of things can be done to control the traffic, but fundamentally it's covering more public areas where the students tend to gather and extending that school network via essential Wi-Fi. So while the first solution was more about bringing that internet to the home, the second solution is more about uh, putting up outdoor Wi-Fi in, in various places. Um, so there is a clear distinction in these two models. But once again, how you bring that Wi-Fi, you could leverage CBRS, 3.5, 5 gigahertz, um, and, and those bands and different technologies to make it cost-effective, seamless. And in the end, if you're managing your school's Wi-Fi network through some type of management system, such as our XMS or CN Maestro, you can imagine the outdoor is going to be managed by the same platform. So all this becomes a transparent uh, network to you. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, the, the picture on the last slide is actually belongs here, but this kind of picks up on that whole concept of MiFi and leveraging cellular network in the sense that uh, the option here, and I'm going to use my uh, uh, laser pointer to show this, but a device like this, where I'm putting my cursor around, is essentially a, let's call it a glorified MiFi device, right? This can sit outside with antennas on it that can then talk to the cellular network. You can put in a prepaid SIM card, connect up an external Wi-Fi device, such as the ones from Cambium, and instantaneously light up. Uh, an area. Uh, the beauty of this solution is this is quick and easy, right? Um, if you're willing to just pay for that SIM card, you can still use that LTE backhaul, but then temporarily bring up Wi-Fi access. And you do that. And then over time, you can say, hey, all right, I don't want to pay for that recurring fee. I'm just going to go ahead and build out a point to multi-point network and then bring that Wi-Fi outdoor coverage. 
Uh, the reason this is not uh, as viable from a residential perspective, then you're going to the same steps of, you know, MiFi device versus external Wi-Fi or a LTE router, and you're paying the recurring fee. But as a short-term solution, this is a great way to get that quick uh, Wi-Fi coverage. Uh, so those are the three main things I wanted to cover. I'm not going to go deep into specific technology about uh, 5 gigahertz unlicensed or CBRS or 3.5 LTE. A lot of that information can be found on our website. But my end message is that you know wireless, wireline, these are complementary solutions. And as we look at ECF, CARES, E-rate, all these are funding options, uh, and the and the next generation of funding that probably will come with the infrastructure bill. Um, the goal for us as a, as a vendor, as you as the service provider serving your communities and school districts is that we all realize broadband has become a absolute necessity like water and electricity. And there are still you know, millions of students and, and population that are underserved and underconnected. And I think this is that opportunity uh, using wireless to really close the divide in a very fast manner. Um, needless to say, you know, the, 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 the big carriers are always going to be pushing the services, the 5G, the multi-million dollar investments. Uh, and our argument there is, look, there's a place for that for sure in our fancy iPhone 12s, but fixed wireless and the different options I provide gives a much more economical solution for school districts to extend their networks and, 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 and bring that connectivity. To bring that point to home, um, what you can find in a very near future is a um, fixed wireless versus a TCO calculator, which actually I will uh, pull up on a, a web page here, is um, we created a tool. Uh, and the tool essentially lets you put in some values of your MiFi device costs. Let's say I put it $150. I say I'm going to pay $50 per month. I'm going to have 1,000 MiFi connections. In parallel to that, we pre-populated some costs on the base station and what it would take for you to do a uh, tower switch, power cabling, and things like that. These numbers, we sort of populated. It could be argued for many uh, hours on what the accurate number is, but our goal was to give a ballpark idea of what it would take if you built out a purpose-built network with a CP at each home uh, with the one-time cost of a router and monthly maintenance being pretty low because you're not paying a recurring fee, you're really paying uh, the internet pipe that you brought into the school building and you're extending that. Um, so how that ends up looking in terms of the MiFi over let's say 10 years or make it you know four years, five years, right? Um, much uh, fewer years and, and take a look at the comparison. Again, this is not meant to be a completely accurate uh, view because you can play with numbers, but at a high level, the message we're trying to give is that paying the cellular industry that monthly recurring cost uh, versus building out something with LTE or 5 gig or whatever you want, uh, how does that look in terms of the ROI? Uh, so that's really the objective uh, of this tool. This will be available on our Camium Network's uh, Homework Gap Solution page. We welcome you to uh, propagate this to your customer base, as well as the folks that are on the call to try it out in a few days, um, just to get an idea, because you know what you're paying for your MiFi, you know what your monthly charges are. Uh, let Cambium plug in the other numbers, or if you're a service provider, plug in the numbers yourselves and see what type of ROI uh, this shows you. So that's kind of the idea behind it. Uh, with that, um, in terms of solutions, uh, you know, what I want to do is before we go into the wrap up, turn the podium over to Andrew Moore, who has graciously joined us uh, from uh, 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 Boulder School District. He's the Chief Information Officer, so we're very excited to have him on the call. Um, Bruce and I will probably do a little Q&A with Andrew, but before that, Andrew, I'm going to open up the microphone to you and you tell us, uh, shed us some wisdom or shed some wisdom on us on what you've done so far and uh, the exciting things that you guys have been doing. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, first, I'm very happy to be here because I've been working on the homework gap digital divide for about six years. And for me, this is all about getting every student connected that is not adequately connected today so they have an equitable opportunity to learn. 
That's the bottom line of everything I'm going to talk about from this point forward. So I am Andrew Moore. I'm the CIO of Boulder Valley School Districts. We're 30,000 students um, serving Boulder, Colorado, and the surrounding suburbs. Um, and with that, you would think, well, Boulder, Colorado, that's a pretty affluent community. Uh, what kind of connectivity gaps could you possibly have there? Um, the reality of it is that Boulder Valley School District is about 20% free and reduced lunch overall. Um, there's pockets as high as 70% at uh, one of our elementary schools. And what that basically means is that one in five um, students go home to a, a, a situation that isn't as ideal as I think most of us would, uh, would agree is needed in this day and age. So um, I embarked on this journey trying to get um, Comcast, um, CenturyLink engaged. Of course, they have their 995 programs, um, but both of those programs at the time back in 2015 uh, were unsustainable for some of our families. So even at $120 a year, um, we still had a, a pretty large gap. And so um, CenturyLink dropped their 995 program that left us only with um, Comcast. And with that, I embarked on an effort to try to find another provider that would um, really partner with us. Long story short, uh, we partnered with Livewire Networks out of Denver, Colorado. Um, unfortunately, Jim Hinsdale, the CEO, could not be with us here today, but he and I have presented on this a few times. Uh, Jim is actually not here because he's working to get our network installed um, and to accelerate it, which I'll hit upon in just a second here. So in all honesty, I'm happy he's focused on his team uh, getting these antennas up on our schools. Um, the agreement we have with Livewire Networks, um, I came to find out, is very unique, and it really is a win-win partnership. Um, we, the school district, are providing um, Jim one strand of fiber to backhaul his network at each school, and we're providing him real estate on all of our schools um, to place uh, his uh, LTE antennas. In exchange for our one strand of fiber and the real estate to put those antennas up, Jim is obligated to provide free internet to all of our free and reduced lunch eligible students uh, that his network can reach. Um, and the school district also gets 25% of his revenues um, that are generated from the towers he's placing on our schools. So from Jim's perspective, he would tell you that he had a very small presence um, in the surrounding suburbs of Boulder. He has a pretty good presence in Denver. And so this was um, a greenfield opportunity for Jim to expand uh, Livewire Networks into Boulder without having to bore fiber. And in Boulder, Colorado, it is named appropriately Boulder because boring fiber is expensive. Uh, we did that as a school district back in uh, 2008, 2009 with a bond uh, that the school had uh, raised uh, in order to get that network uh, in the ground. Uh, so we're definitely fortunate that we've got the network that we could actually backhaul um, him with. Um, we Andrew, do not extend- Andrew, sorry for, sorry for yep. the interruption, this is Saqib. Uh, just to make it a little bit uh, more uh, uh, Q&A type, I wanna ask you a quick question, clarification. Sure. So, so Livewire, you, you provided the, let's just say the backhaul, right? So it's a school's internet that he's able to tap into. And it's then you also- it's actually not. Um, he provides his own internet signal. And that's an important distinction because our internet signal is E-rated. And E-rate uh, prevents us from taking our signal and taking it to the homes of students uh, because E-rated internet signal can only be used in brick and mortar schools. Uh, so all you're really providing Livewire is a, the school campus locations to put up a tower per se right um and then and then there is a fiber uh, strand that you're giving him but he is bringing the internet himself so he is uh a live wire is picking up net new customers but the obligation to you is to provide free internet to your student body correct and and 25 percent of his gross revenue from um, any business he generates from his network Right. So um, I feel like we're given two things, dark wow. fiber for him for the backhaul and school locations. He's giving us two things, free internet to the, the students in need and 25% of his That's revenue. Brilliant. That's brilliant because that 25% recurring revenue goes into school funds, right? So you, that, that's sort of a business. Uh, yeah, right, right. And, and then the win-win situation, like you said. 
That's exactly. Uh, very interesting. Okay. Yeah, very unique. And we um, uh, we had actually been piloting this before the pandemic hit. Um, Jim was on three of our schools. Um, it took us about two years to just get everything set up, test it. And we were at that point where we wanted to ink a, a contract. The contract itself was getting delayed, just uh, you know the, the way things typically move sometimes. Um, but when the pandemic hit, um, it got accelerated. April of 2020, our Board of Education signed the contract with Jim to take it district-wide. And so then the challenge was, how do we accelerate? And the last thing I really want to say is that uh, these the $7.2 billion uh, funds that are available are um, coming. There's still some ambiguity about what they could be used for with regard to network build out. Um, but we used CARES Act funding uh, that came in uh, from the state of Colorado. The state of Colorado got their share of CARES Act. They provided grants to schools. We applied for a grant of a little over a million dollars um, to basically put a capital infusion into our partnership. So the other thing that, that Jim was able to get from this is that um, he didn't have to pay for a million dollars of the capital needed to expand the network. Um, and so we went through all the approval processes. We were very clear what we were doing and open and we got approval. And so the school district bought the Cambian gear it's sitting in one of our warehouses now, and what Jim does is comes and gets that, installs it on the school. Jim is responsible for that network once installed, and any kind of warranty or replacement of those devices over the time are 100% on uh, live wire as we go forward. But the money is allowing us to accelerate the rollout. All right, let me stop there, and happy to um, take this in any direction that you guys would like to take it. Andrew, just out of curiosity, how did you guys connect with Livewire to begin with? Yeah, so um, this all started back um, when I ran internet into a, a low-income housing development in Boulder, um, Boulder Valley School District. I had come from Sun Microsystems, a very innovative um, company, and sure. I brought that mentality with me, and I thought, hey, we have internet. These kids need help. Our, our network ran really close to this development. I ran it in there. Um, I was blogging about it. The FCC came in and said, uh, Mr. Moore, you're in violation of federal law. And that was my awakening that, oh, there's certain things you can't do on E-rate. Um, and with that, I started to look for a partner. And I, you know, in all honesty, Jim and I can't quite remember exactly how we connected, but I do remember the first meeting in a conference room um, at the school district. And we just started to brainstorm what could be and that ultimately were the roots of this contract that is now in place. So you would say that uh, you'd have to have a, a certain level of entrepreneurial uh, want in this, right? To get the right minds to come together? I would say that I've learned over time that my background, um, computer science degree, working in a high tech company, coupled with um, years of government, government experience. I was the mayor of one of the suburbs of uh, Boulder for three terms okay. um, where I learned about the need of our community. They just came together, right? And I, I, I saw the need and I also saw what, what private industry can do. And in all honesty, it was just my passion to find a solution and to have perseverance. And then Jim coming to the table saying, you know, not only can I build my network and profit off this, but Jim cares in his heart too. Um, you know, he's he's definitely making more money and expanding his network, but he cares about these families um, in need. I'll share just a quick story that's very important. When the pandemic hit, we had one neighborhood in North Boulder. We did not have our network expanded yet with Jim. Um, both Comcast, which we have a separate agreement with for with Internet Essentials through the pandemic. They don't, they don't serve this um, trailer park um, because of a dispute with the uh, tenant and who should pay. We brokered a conversation with Jim and the Boulder County. The county owns a jail that sits up on a hill above this neighborhood. And Jim, with his own dime, put up his own antennas just to serve um, those students in need at the jail. And it's right. temporary. It's still in place. It'll be ultimately replaced once we get all the schools um, connected but it showed um, Livewire's willingness to lean in and to say, you know what, I'm not gonna make anything on this now, but it'll pay dividends for me later. Great, mm -hmm. great, great story. 
Andrew, what would your, uh, and I'll hand it over to the audience as well as Bruce, but uh, what would be uh, your one parting message uh, as you wish to propagate this throughout the country, right? What, what is the advice that you'd give? Yeah, perseverance and understand that most IT directors don't have the background um, to do what we've done, but um, there is information now available to help those IT directors that you can direct them to uh, last month, the U.S. Department of Education published a paper on bringing Internet to kids in need. And there are, um, I think it's six, five or six case studies that, that are um, outlined in that um, white paper. We are one of those. And, um, you know, that paper alone in the hands of IT directors should be the catalyst for them to say, oh, hold it. We have multiple ways we could do this. Which one works best for us? Um, and then so long as there's just perseverance, um, all of this is possible. Got it. Thank you. Andrew, Thank you. This, is, this is Bruce. Um, so, so this is a great type of, uh, of case study or use case that you're talking about here. From your experience in working perhaps with other adjacent communities or, or otherwise, maybe just there in Colorado or, or even beyond that, how, how extensible do you see what you did uh, two other areas. I mean, is it, is it a pretty general purpose, you know, in terms of the things that you went through or were there some unique things there? I'm just trying to kind of get an idea of how, how kind of extensive we think this, this kind of uh, arrangement could be to other communities. Yeah. So the biggest hurdle in doing what we did is that we've got fiber in the ground that is not paid for with E-rate funds, which allows us to use it for any purpose we would like. Mm. Um, now, having said that, uh, Jim's first implementation didn't rely on our fiber. He used microwave backhaul, and it worked. Uh, but, of course, fiber is better, and so he quickly shifted to, to the fiber once we opened that up as an option. Now, having said all of that, Boulder Valley School District, um, we wrote with CU Law School an FCC waiver request to allow school districts to use their E-rated networks to run Internet in the homes of kids in need. That has been pending with the FCC. Um, it got stalled out in the 2016 election um, when the um, FCC board flipped from Democratic control to Republican control. Um, the good news is they never ruled on it, so they never said no. Um, and now um, the FCC board is um, right now in a 2-2 uh, split, but likely will become a 3-2 majority for the Democrats. Um, which is likely to um, either have them rule on our waiver request or a number of other waiver requests that have been submitted by the states since that time. Uh, the uh, state of Utah and um, our own attorney general in, um, in Colorado has also submitted their own waiver request to, um, to the FCC. If any of those waiver requests are granted or if Congress changes the laws to allow E-rated internet to be run to home, it will blow this wide open and what we've done uh, should be implementable in just about every district across the nation. That's great. Bruce, any other questions from you? And uh, maybe we check to see, Riley, if we have any questions from the audience today. I haven't yeah, just seen to any remind questions come everyone. through, but... Sorry, Bruce. Yeah, I could probably saying the same thing. Just yeah, reminding everybody we can use the questions panel there to to pop any questions in there. Looks like everybody's being shy. <laughs> Happens. Well, well, I think one thing um, we can talk about here is is you know if if uh, if there are some uh, you know providers that are looking for the next step, um, you know maybe Sakib, you can talk through a little bit what what would be a good um, kind of next step for for uh, for our partners here to work with in in terms of taking some action on here on this. I mean, in their local communities, like like I said, you know how how can we extend this uh, this approach elsewhere? Right. No, that's a good good topic uh, to touch on, uh, Bruce. You know, so I think I think uh, one of the very first things is that you know absorbing that what we are trying to showcase here in terms of the funds and whatnot, right? So that's the incentive. Um, I think the very next thing is, and kind of picking up on what Andrew said, is that you as a service provider need to go identify the equivalent of Mr. Andrew Moore in your school districts. And it may not be the exact fit, but you got to build that relationship, right? I think it's, you need to start that conversation with your respective school districts that you have options. You have options to you know, bridge the digital divide, close the homework gap, however way you want to address it. 
And that option is the service providers. And I think that's one of the very first steps um, to start that conversation. Um, Andrew, if you want to add right. anything there, please do so. But that's kind of one of my messages. Yeah, without a doubt, that's it. And one of the places, two places you could do that, um, there are two professional organizations that I'm heavily engaged when, if, with. Uh, one is COSIN, uh, the Consortium of School Networking. You can find them at cosn.org, cosn.org. It is the K-12 IT professionals. And COSIN is uh, headquartered out of DC. They have lobbyists, they lobby on our behalf. Um, the key, though, is that they have a conference um, every year um, in 2022. It's going to be down in Nashville. But vendors come out uh, for those conferences, and it's a, a great place to connect with school district um, officers like myself or IT directors, people that are in a position to, um, to engage. And so I'd encourage all of you to look into COSA.org and their upcoming conference next year as one of those gateway um, places. The other one is shelby.org, S-H-L-B.org. Um, Shelby stands for Schools Health Libraries Broadband, and they are also a lobbying organization. They focus on um, getting broadband out um, primarily to rural communities, but it all applies everywhere in the nation that you've got unconnected kids. Um, and their whole goal is to get um, um, high-speed broadband out to anchor institutions in a community, whether that's a hospital, a library, a school, so that that internet can then be propagated from those anchor institutions out to the community. Um, Shelby also has a conference coming up. Um, I think it's in October. And um, it's another place you could definitely network. There's not as many uh, K-12 IT professionals at that event, but there are library uh, representatives there. And um, it's just another good place to learn information and how to get connected into our community. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, one question that came in here um, was uh, the Department of Education white paper. I don't know if you have a link, Andrew, or easy way to point to that. So I Somebody do, and I, I could get it to you after the webinar. Believe it or not, I had technical problems on my Chromebook getting in, so I'm actually on an iPad. and. Um, navigating my iPad while I'm on this is just not going to be feasible, okay. but I, I will get that to you uh, post the webinar. No problem. Okay, appreciate it. Yeah, another um, uh, question here, um, Andrew, or, or just kind of following up to what we talked about. So you you were talking about funding um, via the CARES Act, and, and we had you know many customers in the in the educational space. I know that uh, Cambium customers that have, have leveraged money there for infrastructure. Um, do, you had, do you have any perspectives specifically on the ECF because it's brand new um, in terms of how that's going to be uh, working and, and some of the things that we talked about up front there? Yeah, I, so the, the, um, the $7.2 billion appears to have more restrictions on it. For example, building out an actual network, uh, my understanding is that it can only be, the money can only be used if there isn't another provider in those areas. So, you know, the big players, whether you're Verizon or AT&T or Comcast, they typically have some presence. Um, they just may not have adequate presence. And adequate, unfortunately, is not one of the bars that um, you need to get over for the funding. So um, there's a number of us that are working, uh, once again, with Cosin and Shelby about uh, the sustainability of these solutions. And, you know, what we've done is sustainable, right? Uh, Livewire and us have done something that will go on into perpetuity. So at this point, um, Boulder Valley School District is not even planning to um, make a request for any type of network equipment um, through the uh, $7.2 billion offering. Now, having said all that, the rules are still in flux a little bit, and they could um, rule that uh, there's a little more flexibility as they determine how much of those funds are actually being uh, requested. Yeah, that's the the sense I get is that there's definitely some interpretation there, and and yeah. it's new, right? These things are moving quickly because they're emergency funds, so um, it's kind of hard to make some definitive statements here until we see how things are going to actually work out here with the uh, with the approval cycles that they're going through. Yeah. Bruce, um, Makes sense. Bruce, a follow on to that though, right? Uh, so because the uh, regulations talk about an existing network, it doesn't say who that existing network provider is, right? So if a service provider happens to have coverage in an existing network, 
um, a school district could get money and say, hey, I've got 50 students in your coverage area that I want to feed internet to. And Andrew, maybe you can uh, verify that too. But as long as there's an existing network, let's just imagine it's an umbrella of coverage, just like an AT&T tower would provide. And under that umbrella, there happens to be 50 student residential homes that don't have adequate internet. That could qualify, one would think. Yeah, you know, once again, you know, the, the rules are set by the FCC and they're administered and it's really under their interpretation. I think ultimately, um, you know, the FCC wants to get kids connected that are not connected. I've changed that narrative a little bit to say the kids need to have adequate internet, not just connected, but adequate. And really the upload speeds are what we're mainly focused on these days. Uh, because this call right now, I'm assuming some of you, if not all of you, could see my video. It's because I have adequate upload speeds. Um, but when you look at a lot of the offerings, they're still at three megabit, maybe five megabit. And if you put three people on a five megabit upload connection, right, the video just falls apart. Right. And so, um, you know, it seems to me you can make a case. And then whether it's accepted or not, um, I think time right. will tell. Okay. All right, Bruce, uh, was there anything, any other questions that we're seeing come in? Uh, I think that was pretty much it. Yeah, one, one other topic I know we had, we had talked about a little bit here, though, was the related to the, the, the technology, um, you know, perhaps the perception that, that uh, you know, LTE backhaul or some of the things that you talked about might be the way that, that this is typically done, but there's, there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Um, I don't know, maybe you can talk a little bit, Sakit, about that, and we can, yeah, you know, leverage yeah, what, what Andrew's done as well. Yeah, right, right. That's a good good question, too. And I, I think I'll, 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 okay, so first and foremost, um, you know, when you're talking to, and Andrew highlighted this, right, the, the IT director at school districts, the background that they have uh, may not be quite uh, fitting for what we're talking about in terms of a wide area outdoor network. And I think the pandemic reaction of, hey, let's just go get MiFi devices, people walked away with, well, this is relatively easy to, you know, AT&T's got coverage, I don't have to worry about anything, I just fire this guy up and I've got internet. Uh, granted, the feedback we've received is once you start buying 10,000, 15,000 of these devices, you're managing them, you're paying the recurring costs, students uh, go on uh, summer holidays and you have to turn it off, um, and it's not sustainable over time. So, but out of all of that, you know, there is that perception that LTE is the technology that the carriers are using, and that might be the way we should all go. And I think our message there is that is not necessarily the case, right? There is different types of wireless applications, and for that matter, wired solutions um, that is applicable. So while I touch on LTE, Bruce, as one of the mediums, I think there's other spectrum, right? There's a, a five gigahertz spectrum. There's upcoming uh, six gigahertz that's gonna open up a huge swap of spectrum in the United States. So wirelessly, there's multiple options, you know, with millimeter wave, the six gig, the five gig, um, that doesn't have to be necessarily LTE. Um, but I think the end message is just, just numerous options to get that internet to the people that need it wirelessly without going down the path of the uh, cellular operators. Andrew, did you have anything to add there? You might have gone on mute. Sorry, it's a it's about being creative, right? And it's not a one size fits all solution in every situation. And just having the right people in the right room to talk through what could be and what technologies um, are reasonable. Um, you know, in, in our situation, we right. had we had areas where we couldn't get hotspots to work adequately just because the towers weren't close enough because right. the telcos didn't invest in these low income areas and you know because of that we had to you know we had to be creative the jail um the towers on the jail for example and then and yeah something that everybody probably doesn't remember is that that, that hotspot your the MiFi device is sharing the same connection that everybody with a cell phone is sharing right yep. so that student is not going to get the best experience when there's other people on the phone with them, right? So that's why a purpose-built network, a dedicated network gives you that, like you said, the adequate internet connection. It's no longer just having that connection. Now it needs to be adequate. Um, Absolutely. I wrote a blog mm -hmm. on the adequacy question um, last year when I send over the link to the U.S. Department of Education 
uh, white paper. I'll send over that blog link as well. That'd be great. And maybe we'll, you uh, can send it out to the attendees of this. And it puts it into perspective and why I believe we need to look at this as a utility, not as a nice to have. And, and you know, the other thing about what we've done with Livewire is that, yes, we've enabled the students. That's our focus, number one. But the unint positive unintended consequences have been that our communities now have a third player in the ISP space that is charging less. Jim is charging less than the incumbents in our area. So that creates competition, which I believe is a good thing. Right. Um, mm -hmm. it, it also, another positive unintended consequence was that the parents of these students now had adequate internet as well, which right. means their own um, um, job searches, their own, if they want to um, get online to better um, their own education, they had adequate internet at home. So it's not just, the positives are not just restricted to the students, our focus, but there are some really good societal positives um, out of this mm -hmm. as well that Absolutely. the current incumbents are not solving. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, well, I get passionate about this, right? No, and I didn't, no, no. I, I didn't mean to imply anything with the politics of the FCC board with Democrats and Republicans. It's just the fact of the matter that yeah. um, the new administration is being much more open to solving this problem. No, I, I, I agree, uh, Andrew. And, and I think the statement you made about the communities and their parents having internet, right? That That is, that unintended benefit is actually much bigger than we realize, right? Totally. Uh, job search, healthcare, all of that, right? Internet is a basic necessity and, and it's no longer just connectivity, it's adequate internet, right? And all the things we take for granted with good internet, it's unbelievable how many homes are there where that is not the case, right? Yep. So, I mean, this needs to change. Yep. Government needs to step up and we need to remove the bureaucracy and the restrictions and allow people with creativity to solve this problem. I mean, I think I'm just as passionate as you are on this topic. Yeah, I mean, we would not allow clean water for uh, the affluent and um, Dirty water. Yeah. In, inadequate clean water for the non-affluent in our society. We just would not allow that. And I believe the conversation needs to be couched within that context. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, yeah. well put, well put. All right, Bruce, I think we can uh, probably uh, start wrapping this up, uh, getting close to the top of the hour. Um, I, I really enjoyed, Andrew, your uh, point uh, of view and the conversation, Bruce. I think, uh, I hope our audience enjoyed this as well. Any last minute comments, uh, Bruce, before we wrap up? No, I think we, we covered things there and we'll, we'll follow up to, um, to this as we talked about with uh, two of the attendees with the links that we mentioned there, the white paper. Um, and I guess, Andrew, you had a blog as well that you can send us over. So um, appreciate everybody's attending uh, today. And um, this recording as well will be available um, after the webinar too. So, um, you know, we have a 45 day window for this, uh, this homework app application fund, this one, one component of this that we talked about. There's, there's obviously other funding mechanisms as, as well. So um, we will keep, uh, keep on top of what's happening because these things are changing dynamically and, um, and uh, you know, support you moving forward in terms of, uh, you know, Cambium partners and, and what we're doing to uh, provide these solutions. Super. Great. Thank you, everyone. So, right. Thank you, Andrew. All right. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, Thank all. Take care.